Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to talk about a bunch of different topics, okay? SoFi laying off roughly 4% of their workforce, mainly across the board in UX, a lot of software engineers, some uh, of management, not upper, upper management, not executives, but like team managers. All companies seem like they're going through it. There's been a lot of announcements with layoffs and restructurings. And I'm not worried about it because I trust that Noto knows what he's doing. I don't think it's fair for us to criticize when we don't work at the company and we don't know what the plans on the whiteboard are and what they are looking to do and how they're looking to restructure. So if you believe in the management team, this should not be concerned. Let's see what happens in two weeks on the earnings call and what they report. And maybe our story changes. But as of now, it's not a concern. The news should be taken in context. And the context was that this week, SoFi was not the only company to lay off. Unity lay off, Spotify laid off. City is announcing just gigantic, like 20,000 people. Google. That talked about. There's another one. BlackRock announced 600 layoffs this week. It's January, management teams looking at their 2024 goals and then readjusting the team that is going to get them there. No management team on earth will lay off the top 10% of their performing talent. They'll always lay off people that are overpaid for the job that they actually do. The company is still hiring. Just looking through LinkedIn, there's a lot of people, nearly multiple posts every single day this week that were making LinkedIn posts, how excited they are to start working at SoFi. They're hiring left and right. I want to look at the IR statement with you guys because I found it was really interesting. Initially, the rumors on Tuesday night was that the company was laying off 7% of their staff, but they cleared this up and they said it's closer to 4% of the total headcount and it's across all departments. They also said that we plan to continue to grow our team in 2024 and remain committed to continuing to deliver, continuing to deliver strong gap profitability. One of the things that I made in my video this week covering it is why would they use that verbiage continuing to deliver strong gap profitability and not excited to guide for gap profitability or something to that because effect. Continuing means multiple and they are currently in Q1 of 2024, which means they generated gap profitability in Q4 of 2023 and they're going to come out and guide that they are going to continue to deliver gap profitability. The fact of the matter is They've never on paper delivered gap profitability. And so for them to use the word continuing, it stuck out. You can speculate and say it's a hint or it's, you know, an oversight. I think why not just say we remain committed to delivering strong gap profitability. It's continuing to deliver as if that's been the trend previously, which so far it hasn't. But people need to remember, although we haven't seen Q4 numbers, we're in Q1. The team knows the Q4 numbers. And I saw some people who are saying, Oh, well, if they laid people off, then, you know, they're going to have to pay three months severance, like an exit package. So it's not going to be reflecting in the numbers for the next little while for the operating expenses benefits. Some people were even saying that if they laid people off, then they're not going to hit gap profitability. But the fact of the matter is that SoFi did similar layoffs at a similar time in the year in 2023. And they beat every single quarter and kept raising guidance every single quarter. So I'm not too worried about this. Some people were using this as an ability to sort of take shots at SoFi. Turned out to be much more managed. Do we think that this was not just about cutting the waste, but also cutting jobs that we necessarily don't need? If you actually go and look into the high, high majority of the new jobs that SoFi is looking for, they're all in risk, Okay. The, the jobs that were actually cut out was, was software engineering. That's an important distinction. What's also very exciting is Technicus between the years of 2024 and 2025 are supposed to port over four different uh, cores of the business. Lending, invest, uh, credit cards, and uh, checking and savings. That I find very interesting because could this be the first time that we've ported over a core where it would be in timeline, there was... People from the lending segment, UX, which is what Technicus is designed to do, and software engineering, and potentially those jobs might not be as needed or at, at uh, that high of a scale that they might have previously had with a third-party provider uh, that Technicus is maybe doing that. Do you think that we might even see them come out and say, hey, we've already started to utilize Technicus for our own platform? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I, it reminded me of, everything reminds me of PayPal, but uh, you know, they talk about duplication and uh, AI as far as uh, needing to uh, work on those uh, for efficiency purposes. 
And it just seems like that's what's happening here. Anytime you have a merger and acquisition, if you don't intentionally do this uh, as you're merging together, as you're knitting the two to one, you're just going to have a lot of inefficiency because you have people doing things in Technosys, people doing things in SoFi um, that are just redundant. And so this actually, to me, wasn't, you know, it's 4%, so it's not bullish in the standpoint of cost savings. Uh, I mean, it helps a little bit, but uh, the main thing is it's showing how cost conscious they really are. And we're seeing this flurry of layoffs, uh, usually small and targeted layoffs outside of like T-Mobile and Unity um, that uh, seem to be doing the same thing. I think a lot of companies are shifting towards that cost consciousness. A lot of these companies have done mergers in the past and they're just realizing that they got a lot of people that are doing the same kind of job. And I expect that that's what's happening here with SoFi. Look at the actual people who are making the posts. I sort of went into all of their profiles and I found no clear pattern. You have some people in engineering who have a, a wide range of tenure at SoFi, as well as a wide range of seniority at SoFi. And then you also have people that are outside of engineering specifically. There's two conclusions. Number one, it's a very limited data set. So I can't make any speculation as to how they were planning, like how they built the list of people they were going to lay off. Or the second path that leads me down is that it was all performance based because if it's performance based, you know, it doesn't matter if you were with a company in 2018 or with a company, you know, as an intern or with a company for six months. If they are utilizing new technologies from Technesis and stuff that becomes an efficiency platform and they may be 86 people that technology is replacing their jobs. There's a lot of things we don't know. I'm sure they're going to probably touch on it. And if they don't, because of how fresh it is, I would think that one of the analysts on the call is going to bring it up on the conference call and ask about the rest. But we're living in a time where technology continues to advance and more and more back office service jobs can be automated. If they transition to some of those cores of technicists, that could definitely be a reason. I just wanted to talk about the roles because I know people are worried about SoFi trimming due to disparity. On their SoFi careers website, they said they were looking for 45 different roles. The next day, 47. Today, I just checked 53 new roles that they're looking for. They are actively looking for positions. So I don't think that this is from a position of weakness. I think that this is a performance thing, like Tevis said. There always needs to be a time, especially under 5% population cut. There's nothing scary about this, you know? Like, if you're cutting 25% of your, your headcount, you're kind of getting rid of maybe some good people and bad people. 5% is like, you're just getting rid of the bottom feeders, honestly. It's similar to venture capital, there is a power law distribution in the effectiveness of organizations where something like 10% of your top performers account for 50% of your productivity gains as an organization. Those numbers obviously get a little bit more wonky as the company goes into you know thousands of employees, but the flip side also applies, right? There are 10% of your lowest performers that just drain and siphon all the time, motivation, efforts, and they're just a malignant, toxic presence in that organization. It's just good housekeeping, in my opinion. When you're doing it with these small percentages of people, if you're doing it you know, with, with 20,000 people like City is, then obviously that's a bigger restructuring that has to you know, go into it. But this is nothing to be worried about. I'm actually very bullish on the cuts that were made. SoFi landed three large awards from NerdWallet. This is a company that gets nearly, or a little bit more actually, than 100 million visits to their website every single quarter. Every start of the year, they do a best of award for their banking. And during this, SoFi got the three, pro well, two largest awards that we could have possibly wanted, which was best checking account overall across all the other online banks that they look at as well as the best personal loans award overall. This is the website, the NerdWallet Best of Awards 2024. They showcase all these mass amounts of people that come onto their website. This is their biggest article that they do every single year. And SoFi is front and center for personal loans at the very top, you know, following all these other fintechs that do a very great job, but not as good as SoFi. So number one, a lot of other great uh, choices. Chase shows there up there a, a couple of times. But SoFi is the one at the very, very top. Now they're doing this for money. It's not like these are free acquisitions, right? And they're like, we're not paying to be on that slot, but we do get paid based on the uh, 
like a referral bonus, the same way that people would get paid out for bringing people on. Happy for them to pick the best ones because if people can trust their website, not that SoFi is paying them, it's based on the actual products, but it's still good to know that uh, it's not going to lower cat costs dramatically or anything like that. Because this isn't like some rinky dink little personal blog that SoFi is just at the top of. We get 100 million a quarter. 100 million visits a quarter. Imagine what something like that can do for growth. I mean, think about yourself. If you want to open a checking account and you just Google, you know, best checking account 2024 or whatever, this thing comes up at the top and then SoFi comes up at the top of that list. And yep. a lot of people just end their search right there, you know, or at the very least, even if they don't go with SoFi just on the spot right there, it introduces them to the brand. It introduces them to the ecosystem, to the website, to the other products that they have. They get redirected to the website and they can do more research. SoFi is in the conversation. They're in the game to win all of these people. So it is a big deal in terms of the volume of visitors to that site. And if you add on the fact that they're not the only company that's showcasing them, they are the largest. But if you also look at Go Banking rates and money.com and all of these ones, it's about 140 million a quarter once you actually add all the companies up. Pretty interesting uh, realm of not just getting people to sign up, but also seeing that consistent name over and over increases brand awareness, if not already just a, a an initial sign up. Because some people need to see an advertisement. Some people say as, as high as seven to 14 times before they actually use a product. So it's good regardless. That's the reason why people choose a bank ultimately is not because they're driving past it on the way to work anymore. It's because they recognize a name and somebody possibly refers them. Uh, and then the other is they just do a quick web search. And if they're doing a web search, most people are not going to take an Excel and open it up and say, okay, I got the name of the bank and the rate and then the bonus that they're going to give me and the overdraft fees and, and line all of that up. And we're just going to go in and be like, okay, let's, let's do this quick web search. Okay. Yeah. This one looks good. Let me click on it. Looks good. I'll go ahead and go with that. A little bit of light research. And so, in this happens, this helps with the name recognition. So that 500,000 that uh, they got, are guiding for per quarter, usually they guide conservative. It may be lighter even than I was thinking. Uh, and, you know, I was not the most bullish on the user growth as far as you know, Tevis's numbers that we had uh, last month. But if uh, NerdWallet is doing this and other organizations are doing this as well, SoFi will grow a little bit more rapidly than I anticipated that most of us anticipate, except for possibly Tevis. Well, okay, yeah, let's do a little thought experiment, right? I mean, I think I had the most bullish number for new member additions for 2024 to say that SoFi will have their first 1 million member quarter. NerdWallet gets 100 million visits a quarter. To the what? entire website, not, not to that article specifically. Okay, so let's just say 10% is going on that page. That's still 10 million people every three months get exposed to SoFi in the number one slot. It helps. Uh, every little piece helps. Uh, it accelerates the growth of SoFi. It pushes back against this idea that SoFi is just an overvalued bank, just a normal bank. And then if we can keep up these accolades, that SoFi brand recognition is going to come up over and over and over. I was looking through the consumer sides of Citibank, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. They're all saying the same things. People are using their mobile services more than ever. Bank of America even went a little bit further. They said 49% of their sales come directly through digital only platforms. Nearly 50% of people are comfortable enough to say, hey, we will use these services. I'll sign up for a new credit card and I won't need to go into a branch. Well, if that's the case, there's no debate that SoFi will treat you better as a customer. It's just a matter of not needing the branches and not needing the personal relationships. And I personally think, especially in the younger audiences, they don't right now. Personal relationships is a thing of the past, but there are services that you need a physical branch for. Unfortunately, I need a bank that has a physical branch. I need a safe deposit box. Sometimes you need cashier's checks. You don't need to port over your entire banking relationship. The second that you want to start with SoFi, it's not like you have to make a full commitment, right? No, so we're making the commitment for direct deposits a big commitment. And yeah. when you have your whole life set up with a specific bank, it's very hard to move over. Yeah, it was, it was kind of weird listening to JP Morgan and stuff like this. They said they're going to increase their spend on branches and advisors and bankers and all these things. It just seems like the wrong direction. And I think that... No, stop. JP Morgan is a different beast. Their clients have different needs. They're going after a completely different aspect of the market. I get that. I'm just saying from a, from a consumer standpoint that they are benefiting from a lot of large clientele that have a ton of money. 
But whenever I look at Bank of America, even just, just as one example, they have 38 million users who are using mobile only. What are those people doing? Those are not super clientele. There's regular people that use JP Morgan that definitely do not need the service of a branch. And I would say the high, high majority of people do not need it. There are definite, like, like you said, niches and, and products that, that we need. But as time goes on, those on, problems on. will get solved. Bank of America has acquired so many banks over the past 30 years that they yeah. have so many legacy customers. But I will speculate that if SoFi ever released the demographics of not new, new customers, customers that transferred from a different bank into SoFi, I would be willing to bet that the age group is 30 and under, not 30 and over. Well, they do say that their uh, target demographic is 22 to 45. And, and the thing is, is you have to remember, people can still have those legacy services at the traditional banks. It's not an exclusive relationship. You, you can, but look, I am probably a little bit different because I use multiple banks, but some people don't use multiple banks and JP Morgan Chase is a much different bank. When you go through and you look at the things they do, they're just going after a different crowd. As innovation goes, that the things that can be solved only by JP Morgan will slowly start to get solved by technology and that they will have a way to get you certified checks out to you, even through a digital bank. Yeah, but Tanner, that's a very optimistic take. Everybody acknowledges over time, if you zoom out over decades, there will be like a direction shift. I agree with you directionally speaking. I just think that it's going to be over a longer period of time. You know, there's these people that say Tesla is going to electrify all cars within the next 10 years. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, oil and gas. Zero percent chance. Exactly. Zero percent chance. So, because I'll still have an oil and gas. <laughs> My point is, is banking, legacy banking is still the same, like directionally, SoFi every single year might be taking an incrementally bigger chunk out of their pie, but it's going to take a long, long time for SoFi to actually be a real contender in that space. And yeah, Wells Fargo, Bank of America and Citigroup might be bleeding every single quarter, but they're behemoths, man. They take a long, long time to bleed out. And JP Morgan will be the last legacy player standing. It's a matter of when in my mind, not if. But I'm more bearish in terms of how long that will take for SoFi to actually be a real contender. It's not going to happen as fast as bullish people think. Same with Tesla and oil and gas. Same with SoFi. And the only way they become a top 10 financial institution is replicating the big products that the top 10 financial institutions have. You're not getting to be a top 10 financial institution without having an asset management arm or without doing business accounts. It's just not going to happen. What SoFi is doing right now, they're going after younger demographics that don't have a lot of money right now that are not well into their earning curve. But as that business uh, relationship, as that banking relationship grows and is established, they'll retain a large amount of those. I don't see those shifting away eventually to J.P. Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America ever. I mean, a small handful, perhaps, but really not ever. SoFi has the products that they'll cross-sell. And so over many, many years, this is not short-term, but over those many years, those young people will inherit wealth. Uh, they'll get better jobs. They'll get promotions. They'll build businesses. And they'll be doing that on the SoFi platform and, of course, inviting others to do the same. So, But it seems like a short-term view, short-sighted short is the word, what Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan Chase is doing. But it seems like that they're just doubling down on what has worked in the past. And the past is not where the future is going. Long-term, it's going to hurt them. It's going to help SoFi. They can, of course, pivot. They have a lot of assets. And SoFi won't overtake them next year. I think Bank of America is doing the right thing. They seem to be trying to shift a very large cruise ship in the direction digital banking is going. It's just so, so freaking big. Like I was looking at the rate at which they're trimming branches, what it would take for them to get down to zero. And it was like, they'll be there in 2080. It's not going to happen anytime soon. They have these six to $10 billion a year payouts to, to shareholders in the, in the forms of share buybacks and dividends. You're not going to give that away. And so it's going to be very hard to increase to, to get to the rates at which SoFi is comfortable giving back to their customers. Can Bank of America, can a JP Morgan, can these companies, if there's the same same trust and security with the products, can they offer the same rates that SoFi can? The answer is absolutely unequivocally no. Okay, but that doesn't matter. Doesn't because matter. not everybody cares about a rate on a checking account, one. Two, rates are not staying at this level forever. 
It doesn't matter. JP Morgan has so many other lines of business. Right. You're not going to get their institutional people to leave to go to SoFi. SoFi as a conglomerate right. is what we're talking about. No, That's I, what thing. It's I a get conglomerate. That. This is the innovator's dilemma or whatever. It's if they can completely strip away the large banks of the consumers, I think wealth management is going to take a real while. Uh, business banking is going to be next. But honestly, there is such a massive total addressable market just in the consumer banking side. There is so much money to go around just going after the average person. They can play ball in that area. JP Morgan Chase just put up $12.1 billion of net income in three freaking months. Okay. Yeah. They're not it's sitting on their hands. But do you know what the revenue uh, growth was for Bank of America? Negative uh, 3%. These banks are so large that if Bank of America is down 3% or down 4% a quarter and SoFi keeps climbing, the amount of time where they will intersect is not going to be a short period of time. It's going to be decades. So if I were to reach a top 10, they need to do something like a 10x by assets. And it's just going to take so much longer for them to go from number 10 all the way to number four or number three, because the numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That really demonstrates how centralized all the financial institutions are because of all of these different lines of business that Steve is talking about. SoFi's business model will have to change. It's not if you can win the consumer, you can win the day. It is today, but that will only take you so far for SoFi to be seen as a conglomerate, as this one-stop shop for them to do everything. JP Morgan could lose their entire consumer banking platform and be fine. I'm sure JP Morgan will stick around. I'm talking about this is a massive area SoFi has a good chance of going after it. Once they do, they'll have a lot more power to go after other markets. SoFi created an entire financial services platform in two years. They need to expand it. They have the platform. They just need to replicate that for business. Yeah, but they're, they're in an ocean right now with a little net. And you're saying you need to go fish in two oceans. It's like, yes. why don't we just focus yes, on this right now? Two, they need to fish in three oceans. Actually. Yeah, but but it's we can only catch so much right now. You know? That's not true. Absolutely. You, you can build a business division and start with small market and then work your way into middle market. I actually agree with Steve here that they need to start business uh, sooner rather than later. And this is the year. You know, they're going to be newly gap profitable. It takes a while for something new to get established. And so... If they started quarter one, mass hiring, a lot of advertising, a lot of vectors, that would be dangerous towards the promise of gap profitability. So, But then the later half of the year, as it continued to grow, I think they really need to focus on that, uh, if not early next year. Rates are still high, which means SoFi can offer a much larger rate. You yes. need to do the business now while you still yes. have a forehandle on rates. Because as rates go down, SoFi is going to have to bring the rates down. And yes, they're going to be ahead of everybody else, but businesses are going to be less likely to switch over if there's not a kicker for it. And that 4 or 5% yield on business cash would be a huge kicker to get people. So yes, they should start immediately. Generation X maybe wants a uh, physical bank presence. Millennials, they tend to not care about that at all. So it's just odd to me that it seems like so little attention is being paid towards the future growth, uh, where they're investing just seeds now, which yes, take a long time to germinate and grow, but will pay dividends in the future. I just want to see what they do on their tech platform. I'm hoping for big news out of that because that's going to what gives them that hybrid multiple. That's the aspect that I'm more bullish can accelerate because for other business lines, for them to reach parity, they have to first establish that foothold and then stand all of these different business lines up. Whereas Galileo is going to be collaborating with all of these legacy financial institutions as opposed to com you know, competing with them. Essentially, it's going to become a necessity over the next five years as regulations move towards the modernization of banking infrastructure. And that's where you have that premium or that X factor of SoFi going parabolic. This was done by Cornerstone Advisors, actually by Ron Shevlin. He's a senior contributor for Forbes. Bank accounts opened by type of institution. So looking at mega banks, regionals, communities, union or credit unions, and digital banks and fintechs. Digital banks and fintechs from the time of COVID in 2020 to 2023 has still accelerated all the way up to 47% of new checking accounts opened had been from fintech. And this is new bank accounts open. What is typ who typically opens a new bank account? So let, let's look at this slide then. Not new bank accounts. Percent okay. of consumers that call a mega bank their primary checking account provider. Between the times of 2020 to 2023, How Gen Z, millennial, Gen X, and yeah. baby well, How boomers. big is the sample how, size of this? How big is the survey? 
I don't remember. So you guys are not giving credit to that is a I completely mean, viable. This could be a hundred people. Way. It could be a thousand people. I don't remember the exact sample size right now, but 5,000 would be a complete viable a amount of people. You can't survey the world. No, it wouldn't be. 5,000 5, people across 50 states? Yeah. I, I think it's actually 1,000 people does 5, make a viable people survey. 5,000 people a 380 million country? <laughs> yeah, but, but it's to get an average. Exactly. You can't, you can't exactly. get a survey across every single person, so you have to get a sample okay, size. So that doesn't I'm mean that it's the wrong though. Because it doesn't fit your narrative that you're you're instead of not knowing, you're choosing to base it on the side that you is, think is incorrect. If this is a hundred thousand people, that holds a lot more weight than if it's a thousand people. If everybody has access to all of these statistics and graphics and banks have entire divisions that are dedicated to monitoring these trends, why have legacy banks not shown any sign of being threatened by SoFi at all? The answer they is they're is, showing is they're showing the scale or lack thereof. They're showing lowering deposits every single quarter, okay? They're making so much from their loans that they continue to make more money every quarter, so no one's bothering or worrying or batting an eye, but it's but really it's risking future growth. Everyone wants to point at Bank of America, none of these large banks talk about customer count. Why do they not show member counts? They only show what's their actual loan performance okay. doing. They're not, they're not trying to they're not in growth mode. They're not trying to convince a narrative. I know they have they're in, they're tens of billions mode. of dollars that they're generating in net income. I'm aware that People they're in are too ball. bullish on fintech as a sector. Dude, I am not at all. There's a time when things go completely digital. Banking will go completely digital. There when? is zero point to have cash in your pocket to get stolen from side, somebody else. Side bet. Side sure, but like when? When, when? Like what is your rough? Side you know, when? I, I don't know. Like, 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 I'll give you a five year, a five year spread plus minus. Like, what do you think? Like fifteen years out. Fifteen years. This is the uh, this is back done back in twenty twenty one. The great wealth transfer. And so it's showing present wealth of current generations. This is 2021, so it shifted a little bit. You can see that huge spike with baby boomers being $71 trillion. And uh, you can see where that shifts over 2045, that baby boomers have, they're, they're just not around anymore. It's not that they lost right. their money. And that goes primarily to Generation X, Millennials, and of course, Gen Z and younger. These generations care much less about the physical presence. Some will, some will need that. There are, there's going to be a physical bank, you know, for the next hundred years or whatever, but banks will be primarily digital as these generations continue to grow. They become more wealthy and they get their banking needs met by something that's a little bit savvier, that, that has that name that they recognize, it has that app that works well for them. They do not want to go into a physical bank. I have two sons that are in that uh, new working age. One's a college student, one's working. They and never want to go into a physical bank ever and will do anything they possibly can to avoid it. Most of my coworkers are millennials. There's even some Gen Z folks. They do not want to go into a physical bank ever. They talk about it just being an awful experience. They don't like standing in line. They don't care that there's free coffee and donuts or whatever. They don't care that there's someone to meet with. They view that as, as just a major thing that they don't want to do. And so over these next 20 years, we're going to see a point when digital banking becomes not just a niche thing, but becomes the norm. And I think it'll happen. I think 15 years might actually be a little bit uh, later than when that 50% threshold gets hit. So l let me put it like this, Roy. And I totally agree with you that we are going to have a gigantic wealth transfer. And what's going to happen is those boomers are going to pass on all of their wealth to Gen X. And then we get to millennials after that. Right now, I mean, boomers are between the ages on average of 60 and 80. And Gen X is between 45 and 59. In 15 years, both of these cohorts will still very strongly be around. That wealth will not have shifted as much as you think it has. But in you know 30 years or 40 years, it will have been placed in the hands of all of these millennials through inheritances. And then you're going to see more of that shift. That's all I'm saying. But this is half of the story. And again, this isn't looking at the earnings curve. That baby boomers, they're not earning anymore. There's very few that are actually earning. Silent generation, not at all. Uh, generation X, they are at the peak of their earnings curve right now. Millennials and Gen Z, they're establishing new careers. They're starting new businesses. They will be raking in money while the other generations are not. So this is and, only half of the equation. That and we're this seeing. is even more of a reason why SoFi needs to fish in three ponds. Because as this occurs, as boomers, God forbid, start to pass on, and assets get distributed, somebody that comes into a couple of million dollars or even a couple hundred thousand dollars or comes into a piece of real estate that was their parents' primary real estate and they end up selling it because they don't need it or have any plans to 
um, keep it and keep the carrying costs going, they may look for an asset management branch to move larger sums of money into. You're not putting that in a savings or checking account. Asset management is one of the most important things that SoFi can really do. Yes, they have ETFs, but they don't really have an asset management branch. Like they really do need that. It's, and this is even more of a reason why. People will also possibly take some of this money to start a business or take a chance on something. Hence, you need business banking. There's a huge wealth transfer that will occur. It's occurring right now but it is gonna to continue to quicken. And SoFi needs to have a wider net to catch more of this inflow. SoFi needs to expand their net to get more of the inflows that are gonna be going elsewhere. That's the biggest thing. They don't need a physical branch. No, I, I think you're 100% right. I think, I think that what makes great companies like in that innovator's dilemma is that they hyper-focus on one product and that's what allows them to beat the incumbents. And if they just try to do everything that the incumbents are doing, they're just going to get squashed by scale. Yes, they can do it a little bit differently, but core banking is still core banking. Core banking is not going to change. Asset management is asset management. That's not going to change. You're still going to have a need for a checking account, a savings account, and an investment account, and ETFs and mutual funds for the next 100 years. Like That is not going to change. How they get delivered, how people access them, that can certainly change. But the core thesis around banking is not going to change. And SoFi needs to be able to grab all that stuff. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. Somebody asked Steve whether he was Gen X. And actually, Steve makes the cut. He's millennial along with the rest of us on this call, except for Tanner, who's Gen Z. I am Gen Z. Yeah. What is the dates for millennial? Uh, 20, I don't know what I am. In 2024, it's 28 to 43. I am millennial. You made the cut. Yeah, it's uh, I'm at the very first year for Gen Z, which is 97. Look at, look at just that as an example, just to wrap up this episode. Steve is a millennial, OK, not not a boomer or whatever. Gen X, he's a millennial. And even he is not buying an EV just yet. Even he doesn't have all of his banking with SoFi just yet. And so there's I don't have any of it with SoFi. I have a SoFi account with not a lot in it, just so beautiful. I can say I'm a member. Beautiful. So. That's, I, I think, the point that we're trying to make. It's like, yeah, all the young people that don't have any other bank, that don't have any hooks in them and are starting their life fresh, they're unbanked when they come out of university. Yeah, sure, they might start with SoFi and they might build a very long relationship with SoFi, like, but it's going to take a hell of a long time for all of these other generations where the real money lies to make that shift over. Like, I'm going to make it very clear. I would love to do my banking with SoFi, okay? My wife handles all of the expenses and she takes care of all the bills. Okay. Our whole life is set up around a specific bank that has our direct deposits going there. She doesn't want to change. And I'm pretty sure that that's a pretty much a lot for everybody considering I actually don't know any of my friends that utilize SoFi. In order to move your life around when you, when you already have all your direct deposits and all your bills coming out of your account, it's a hassle that nobody wants to do. Thank you all so much for watching. To the members, you'll see the video coming out tomorrow. Bye for now.